you quite literally, Evan, I think are too young to have seen this ad, but am I? I think so. well, I mean, you could have found it on YouTube, but I, I don't think it was running when you were a kid, is what I'm saying. Okay. I, I don't remember the company, but there's this young woman and she's like, Mom, I have kind of a personal question to ask you. And her <laughs> mom says, Okay, honey, go ahead. And she's like, Mom, do you douche? <laughs> She's like, of, of course. Now I remember this commercial. Of course. You do? <laughs> yes, of course. And mom, do you douche? And then her mom's like, totally. All the time. You know? By the way, mm. douching is so terrible for vaginas. I'm just telling you, it's the worst. So don't do it, people. Think, this is a PSA. I think everybody knows that, right? Don't do it. I mean, no, people still, some do it. I don't know, but they should know. Don't do people it. People still douche? I think well, so. I mean, those companies are still putting out, you know, Summer's Eve still puts out those products. Summer's <laughs> Eve makes me feel fine. <laughs> That's not how that goes. <laughs> blowing through the jasmine in my mind. Wouldn't it be blowing through vaginas in my mind in our version? <laughs> yeah, that's immediately where my mind went. <laughs> or vulvas, yeah. <laughs> blowing through the vulvas in my mind. Yeah. Vulvas in my mind sounds like a band name. It does. That sounds like an amazing band name. That's a band I want to be in. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are vulvas in my mind. <laughs> are you ready to rock? Are we ready to rock? Theater, a podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Megan Kearns. I'm a contributor to Edge Media Network and a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. My name is Dave Riedel. When I write about movies, I do it for Salt Lake City Weekly, and I'm also a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And my name is Evan Crean. I am co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living and co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Yeah, you are. I forgot. You, <laughs> yes. Forgot your tagline. <laughs> so this week, we have some movies to share and to talk about with you. We're going to be covering Kajillionaire, The Devil All the Time, Odo Lenghi and the Cakes of Versailles, and Residue. Mm. So the first film we're going to talk about is, speak of the devil, Residue. Residue. Which I keep wanting to say in the tune of Xanadu. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tis not Xanadu. <laughs> it is By not. By any means. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is most definitely not. <laughs> no. Tis not. Tis a film about the gentrification. <laughs> the Yes, the gentrification of <laughs> Washington, D.C. <laughs> and this yeah. is written and directed by... And I hope I pronounced this correctly, Mirawai Garima. And this is his directorial debut. And it's a very personal film because he is from DC and he mm -hmm. left to go to film school and came back, much like the protagonist, Jay, in this film, who left and went to LA, went to film school, and then decided to come back in order to write a script about his neighborhood. But mm -hmm. <laughs> alas, to his dismay, the white people have moved in and gentrified as we do because we're the worst. Yeah. Yeah. He goes back to the street, Q Street, where he grew up, where his parents had a place and he actually moves into their downstairs apartment. He is a, a there's a white tenant in the upstairs apartment and uh, his parents live still in the area, but they've moved out from the neighborhood and have a house, but they're still in an area where everyone's trying to buy their house so they can flip it. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the things I, there are a lot of things I think are really interesting about this film, but especially one of the things that I found so compellingly intrusive was the noise. You are consistently bombarded with the noise of construction mm -hmm. and almost yes. to the point where it makes it difficult to hear dialogue and to, to sometimes focus. It, it feels very mm -hmm. disruptive and distracting, which is exactly how it would feel. Not only, you know, literally being in that neighborhood, but also emotionally and metaphorically too. It would be so intrusive. Right. Yeah. It, it permeates the film and mm -hmm. it really, there are moments where you can tell that the character Jay can't even 
think because yeah. he's just so inundated with the noise of construction and gentrification. I think one of the things that I really like about this movie is the way it blends the past and present. Yes. Yes. And they feel very seamless. So when Jay gets back to his neighborhood, he has all these kind of flashbacks to his childhood memories, you know, pleasant ones of fireworks and gatherings and hanging out with friends. I mean, there's also a, a, an undercurrent of the violence that has happened in the neighborhood, you mm-hmm. know, the police brutality, that's all part of it. But I love that the 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 way it blends in past and present. One of my favorite scenes is when Jay gets into the car with his mom and he's sitting in the front passenger seat. The camera moves to the back seat and the window rolls down and it's Jay as a kid. And we're just immediately transported to this scene in the past of this moment mm-hmm. where him and his friends are about to get in the car and, and go out to the, you know, they say the mountains and like the woods basically for a kind of I don't know if it's like an afternoon getaway or just kind of a, I don't know, a respite from the city. But I love that scene. I think it's, in my opinion, the best use of that technique of kind of blending the past and present together. Yeah, no, it's absolutely beautiful the way it's done. Yeah, the editing is really interesting in this. And I agree with you. I absolutely love the way that the memories just spill forth. And we see that on screen. Like there is no separation between what's a memory and what's actually reality in the present. And like, Mm -hmm. it also is really interesting when he goes to visit his friend who's in prison and it cuts back and forth between his friend sitting in front of him Mm -hmm. in prison, as well as them, the two of them having a conversation in the woods outside. And it just, it seamlessly moves into like the the way the conversation, like where he would like to be having a conversation, you know, in the woods, thinking about the past, but like the past and the present are merging in such a unusual but beautiful way it's really Mm -hmm. and really stunningly done visually and thematically yeah that is a it's a terrific scene and i love that choice to have them in the woods Mm -hmm. in a freer location talking and catching up and it's such a great contrast for what we know would be happening where they're probably talking to each other from behind glass Mm -hmm. they can't hug they can't joke around and wrestle like we get to see them do in the scene because the character he's visiting mike was an older brother kind of character was it mike no it was dion was the older brother Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they had a, you know, he was an older brother type figure. And there's a scene where he jokes, oh, you know, he taught me how to fight. And um, Blue, his uh, girlfriend, makes a joke and says, really? <laughs> like, you don't know how to fight. You don't know anything about fighting. <laughs> which is, which is kind of true. I mean, Jay is a little bit more of an introverted kind of character, which is, I think, all the more effective when we reach the kind of like... Oh my God, yeah culmination of jay's frustration i mean part of it is that he can't find his friend demetrius that he grew up with mm-hmm. who he, he knows that he moved and people say that he moved but everyone is really dodgy about giving him answers about what happened to demetrius and i think that in itself is a really interesting metaphor about erasure and gentrification of like here's someone a whole person that for all intents and purposes doesn't exist anymore except in jay's mind um but what things really reach a boiling point for him when he is kind of wandering the neighborhood and he's looking out into the distance or something at a fence and he sees these two white guys walking towards him and they immediately cross the street because they're afraid of him. And he just gets really angry and he goes and sprints at them and then he starts you know, beating up one of the guys and then the other guy calls 911 and he kind of chases him but then he runs away. And there's this chase that we see at the end of the movie where he's being chased by several people and there's this white couple that are sitting up on their roof deck, essentially having a brunch conversation (laughs) while they see him being chased away. And they're like, oh, sometimes that happens in the neighborhood. No big deal. Back to whatever inane conversation we're having. Not, oh, there's a guy who's in trouble and needs help. Not, oh, that's something we should, you know, call for help on. Oh, that just happens. Anyway, back to whatever stupid thing I'm talking about. I think that's just such an amazing Mm -hmm. representation of gentrification and 
the kind of attitude that people have when they you know move into mm-hmm. these neighborhoods and they take them over and in, in, in even in the first scene when jay arrives some you know white guy walks up to him and says oh we need to turn the music down in your car or i'm gonna call the cops on you and you're mm-hmm. double parked and like screw you <laughs> <laughs> I think what's that's the scene where the where the couple at night is watching them w- watching Jay be chased by the cops is so disturbing and such a crystallization mm-hmm. of the whole point of the film in many ways. But their their conversation is actually even more disturbing because the guy asks the woman, he's like, "Oh, does this sort of thing happen all the time?" And she's like, "No." You, she's like, "I guess it used to, but they really cleaned up the streets." And it's like. Ugh, like rather than thinking yeah. about how you know police brutality is you know driving crime you know and and causing issues no it's of course you know it was cleaned up because the streets were dirty and that also really ties in to when jay gets really angry at blue at a party when some random white guy gets you know weed and he's like all pissed off rightfully so because she's going to smoke weed there and he's like what are you doing he's like you know we have friends you know like essentially like we have friends locked up for this and you know you're just going to do this with these strangers and i also love that we never see in throughout the entire film we never see a single white person's face that's not obscured or shielded or covered by sunglasses mm-hmm. at all they're like it's it's almost like they're faceless and in the credits they're all um credited as gentrifier like dog walker gentrifier you know like mm-hmm. um such and such gentrifier and yeah it's just it's it's such I don't I want to say eye opening but it's not because this I mean this is this is an experience obviously you know myriad people face especially black people and people of color but it's just to see it done in a film done so well is really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I think I really loved what this movie had to say and I really loved some of the ways that it said it. I think I struggled at points because for me it felt a little too stream of consciousness/ slash very stylized Mm -hmm. um and i struggled with staying in it with what was going on like especially the beginning with the really distorted music the times when it would kind of bend into this really kind of distorted music dialogue i felt myself kind of getting like pulled out a little bit but i i really did like what this movie had to say and its Mm -hmm. ideas and like i said i loved the way it blends the past and present together and i thought it came to like a a super strong conclusion. I agree. And it's funny, I agree with you too about kind of losing my place a little bit. Like sometimes there were, mm-hmm. and it was hard because I would kind of lose the moment and I'd be like, oh wait, what's going on? And it wasn't because the film isn't interesting or compelling or anything like that because it is and it's visually just stunning. But there were moments where it was just like, wait, what? What's happening? And yeah, it's, and I found myself kind of drifting off a bit. Um, but overall, yeah, I think this is an incredibly strong film, really strong debut. So many shots are just so great. Like the fireworks uh, scene that you mentioned is just absolutely Mm -hmm. gorgeous. I love that sometimes shots are done upside down, um, or sideways, like, you know, the The brunch scene in particular Mm -hmm. where they see the women brunching and having a good old time and the ground starts bleeding. Yep. Yep. (laughs) So good. Yeah. Yeah, I also think the title is really interesting because, and I, I keep thinking about it because there's that scene with um, Jay and his mother and mm-hmm. she's mad at at um, a couple who are walking their dog and she's like, don't let your dog shit in my yard because, you know, even when you pick it up, it leaves a residue and, you know, they call her a bitch and, you know, are awful to her and, you know, Jay's getting up in arms and she tells him to calm down that, you know, people are like that and I read an interview at Film Days with um, with the director, and he talked about how the idea of residue kind of thinks of, it's tied to how white people, when they leave things behind, they leave like mm-hmm. mansions or cars or like there's there there are these big expensive things. But when black people are forced to leave a neighborhood, it's like a watch or something small and. It's, it was just this, it was really interesting conceptually thinking about what it is we leave behind. And he said, it's, it, he's like, you can't even call it a legacy because that's not what it is. And mm-hmm. thinking about people, you know, coming in, pushing you out of your neighborhood, pushing you off land, you know, 
that is in a, in a country that is so violent and horrific, you know, to you and to your people. It's just, yeah, it's just into your community. It's just, yeah, it's awful. That's really awesome insight. I'm glad that I learned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a really good interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I read it too. <laughs> hmm. I was going to say, spoiler piece me into wanting to see it. Yay! So. You should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely, definitely. All right. Well, let's move on to our next film, which is mm-hmm. the documentary Otolenghi and the Cakes of Versailles. Mm, cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was very Bart, Sim- not Bart, uh, Homer Simpson of you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it's a short documentary too. It's an, it's an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Very short. It's um the, the plot is it follows this Israeli chef, Yotam Odolenghi and uh, this special project that he embarks on to bring the sumptuous art and decadence of Versailles <laughs> to life in cake form at the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So he basically recruits an all-star team of different chefs, wildly different specialties to create these cakes inspired by the Versailles court um, in France. And I don't forget the you know, jellies. Yes, and the, the jellies. jellies. <laughs> the, how can we forget the jellies? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> there, I, I, I can say I wish that there was more food footage in this movie. Because <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of really cool pastry chefing going on. <laughs> I'm going to turn that into a verb. There's a lot of really fascinating techniques, but I wish I was seeing more of them and less of the talking head interviews. I love the content of the interviews. I mm-hmm. think each chef has a really fascinating backstory. I love hearing about their experiences. I love hearing about chefs that come from non-traditional backgrounds, architects, designers, people who fell into, you know, being a chef because they did something else. I think they bring such fascinating perspectives to their work and to their art. I love that aspect of it. But when we're talking about that, I wish we were looking at them doing the food or hearing more of their methodology behind the decisions that they make. For me, that was, a, I think, a miss in the documentary, even though I, I thought this was a cool idea. I loved fo- following it. I just wish there was more food. <laughs> mm. Interesting, Megan. <laughs> yeah, I also wish there was more food. Um, I thought this was great. And this is Laura Gabbert's documentary. And just want to say that. And I really, really love this conceptually. I love hearing Otolenghi talk about his background and talk about his process. Um, I loved hearing, you know, he's, I mean, he's, you know, a James Beard award winning, you know, cookbook Mm -hmm. author, you know, he has so many, you know, delis, you know, in England and elsewhere. And so hearing his hearing about his approach to food in a very historic mm-hmm. anthropological way and you know being an anthropology major myself I, I love hearing that and I'm you know I love hearing about the history of food and the culture of food so hearing all of that was really really great um, but I and here and I agree with you Evan that I loved hearing about all of the various backstories of the pastry chefs and I'm mm-hmm. going to use pastry chef loosely because not you're right. Not everyone was actually a pastry chef. Like the right. jelly, Bompas and Parr, they are not pastry chefs. Um, they did the jellies. But yeah, I loved hearing his reasoning and logic as to why he chose the people he chose. I loved hearing their backstories. But I do agree with you. I would I would have liked to have seen more food. And I wonder if that was a conscious choice. Like I wonder if mm-hmm. they, I wonder if, you know, Gabbert and her team were not allowed to do more footage or to show more things. Like, I wonder mm-hmm. if the chefs were like, nope, you can't see until it's done. I'm curious about that Could because be. it, it is a really weird choice to have a food documentary and not show more food. And right. when the event happens, like we're seeing it as if we're kind of trying to like squeeze through people to get glimpses of the displays. And it's like, mm-hmm. why wouldn't you do an overhead shot so we could really see it? You right. know, like, especially like the, I think Janice Wong, when she did the forest, like, I really want to see that forest. I really want to see what that looks like. And we don't Mm -hmm. really get a sense because she's doing like kind of a mock-up of the gardens of Versailles. And we don't really get to see that fully. And that's, that's, I think, unfortunate because 
if you want to see a food documentary, you really, I mean, yes, of course, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a food nerd, you obviously want to hear people talk about food, but you also want to see the food. So I agree. Right. Yeah. And you want to hear their, you want to hear their decision making. I mean, I, w I think we got some of that with the chocolate. Mm -hmm. The way that the chocolate was sculpted into the wall and those beautiful masks. They were just incredible. I couldn't even believe they were made of chocolate. I well, yeah, I'd love to hear more of the craft and the decision making process that these people are going through. I think possibly a function of that could be that this is kind of uh, looking at such a narrow window of time, basically. Mm -hmm. For the most part, it's looking really at the couple of days of prep before this event, then the event, and then a little bit of kind of wrap up after the event and i'm wondering if maybe that had something to do with why they didn't get more they were just maybe they were a small crew and they had to just run around and get as much as possible in a very short window maybe i mean i like that focus i like that it's such a you know focused and you know so short temporally like i th i think that actually is a strength of the documentary but you you know that could mm -hmm. be why they didn't get more food footage but it is it is yeah it is interesting dave what did you think hmm I think I come down a little bit on the opposite side from you guys. Uh, I didn't dislike it. I'm just going to go and oh. put that out there. Didn't dislike okay. it. But I think what I found really, I couldn't stop thinking about this the entire time I was watching it. You know, Adelengi and, and some of the other chefs and, you know, the curators and whomever else, they went to great pains to talk about the history of food at Versailles and what it meant to royalty, what it meant to, for lack of a better word, peasants, blah, 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 and really gave a good overview of sort of the class struggle. And they do, of course, put to rest the notion that, you know, Marie Antoinette ever said, let them eat cake. Thank God. Um, yeah. I think, I wonder if there are people who still think that's true. Anyway. Um, there are. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> they go to great pains to talk about the class struggle in France right before mm -hmm. the revolution. Yes. But then you have them preparing all of this food that is impossibly expensive mm -hmm. for an event that is for the elite of the elite. Right. Like, yeah. And it's just like, do we understand the dichotomy we're laying down here? Is anyone addressing this? But he so, does. Odalengi does address mm -hmm. that at the end. Mm -hmm. And it might, I mean, you could argue it might be too little too late, but he does address that. Yeah, I felt like it was a little bit of a throwaway or, <laughs> or tack on. <laughs> That's fair. Um, no, that is fair criticism. But the other thing, I just couldn't stop thinking about that. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, I'm not like, you know, like a, well, I guess I am kind of a class warrior. But anyway, um, <laughs> which is probably why I thought about it. Uh, the other thing that I thought about was um, there's this one moment with, I can't remember the name of the chef. She's the Ukrainian chef. And she's doing this. I don't know what she, I don't remember what she was making, but she's got this enormous mixing mm -hmm. bowl. They can't get the mixture right. They can't get the consistency mm -hmm. they want. Yeah. There's this other guy there who's a chef and not part of her team. I think, I think he works at the museum. He as, does. Yeah. yeah. And he's just like bullying her into putting, is it cocoa butter? What was it? It's I don't cocoa butter. butter. Yeah. It's cocoa butter. Fat mm -hmm. into her, I, into I don't her know if it's custard or a bit. Yeah. I forget exactly what it was. And she's just like, and she keeps switching back to, you know, talking, uh, not talk, talking in her native language to, to who she's working with. And she's like, I don't think cocoa butter is the answer. I think it's going to add too much fat. I don't like this. But she relents and the cocoa butter doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning, we, we don't know how she solved the problem because they don't explain that. But she solved the problem without having to add more cocoa butter. But I was just like, who the fuck is this fucking guy? <laughs> Jesus, get the fuck out of yeah. here. She's a world-class chef. Mm -hmm. but she will figure it out. Fuck you. And I, it, I, if I had to guess, my guess would be she put the cocoa butter in so she could like mix it and be like, see, it's wrong, motherfucker. Let me figure this out. <laughs> but I don't know because the documentary doesn't go into that level ex of explanation. That's true. I mean, it, it might just be enough to be like, look, this guy's an asshole. <laughs> but, you know... Um, it does let it speak like, for itself. Yeah. The yeah. I, I was just watching that scene and just being like, Jesus, why did someone punch this guy in the dick? God. Um, yeah. By the way, that's Dinara Costco. Her name? Yeah. Chef? Dinara Costco. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So those, that's what the, the overall, the, you know, the class struggle thing. And then that one moment. And the rest of the time, I was just kind of like, Jesus Christ, just fucking shut up and bake. What did Jesus fuck? Who are you trying to <laughs> shut up and bake? <laughs> 
I, the filmmakers, them? really. No, no, no. But I mean, to your, to, you guys were talking about, you know, this is a food documentary. There's really not that much food in here. And I do think it's interesting that like the behind the scenes, you had that one guy who... I don't know if Odalenghi hired him or if he worked for the museum, but he was kind of like running back and forth between all of the kitchens and making sure mm-hmm. all the chefs had what they needed. And I would have liked to follow that guy around for a day and watch Ooh, him put out fires. That yeah, cool. that would have been. You know? cool. I think he worked for the museum. He did. I think he was working for the museum, and he, yeah, he was kind of the coordinator slash fixer. I remember a scene early on when there's some ingredients missing in the kitchen, and he has to figure out how to make them appear. <laughs> short amount of time yeah yeah um i just want to say though as far as like needing more food in a documentary there are actually quite a few shows and like docuseries that i've watched about food that actually have like not a lot of food in them so i don't Mm -hmm. need that per se but what i but i wanted it specifically at the end and it's like I was like waiting 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 and i was like okay i'm not gonna see a lot of food now that's fine that's fine that's fine but At the finale, I should see it. And yeah, Mm -hmm. so that was kind of a disappointment. Um, Dave, you talked about that scene, which is such a great scene. And I also want to talk about a scene that I actually loved, 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 and made me choked up and was such a great scene. And it's like a quiet scene. And I feel like it's a scene that maybe not everybody will really, I don't want to say notice, but maybe we will focus on. But it's a scene where Oda Lange is talking in an interview, in a talking head interview, and he talks about his background and how he got into Mm -hmm. um, being a chef. And he says that he, you know, he was going into academia and he didn't like the academic world and he wrote his parents a letter, which is like kind of so like lovely and they were, you know, they were sad but supportive. And he says that he was, um, he started really late in life being in a kitchen and he was about, everyone was about eight to 10 years younger than him. And as someone who started writing professionally very late in life, I can very much relate to that. And it just really hit me in a really personal and emotional way. And then coupled with the fact that he talked about how he didn't feel fully comfortable in a kitchen because he, as a gay man, he felt, you know, it, it, mm-hmm. it is such a macho world which it is. And he felt he just didn't fit and he felt he was, you know, unusual. And what I love about that, besides the fact that he, you know, is gay and talking about being, you know, a gay man. I also love the fact that he runs his kitchens in a very different way. He runs Mm -hmm. very different than a lot of other chefs run. I mean, a lot of chefs run their kitchens very much as kind of like a taskmaster and very much like this is what you're doing and this is what's happening and, you know, kind of, I hate to say this, but kind of dictatorial. And he doesn't seem to run his that way. He seems to run his much more, you know, differently in a different approach and unique approach. And I really like that, that he talked about that. And Mm -hmm. just, that scene is just great. Agreed. Yeah, that is a, that is a great scene and I'd forgotten about it. And you even see him the way he interacts with people, they show him in the kitchen talking with people mm-hmm. that's so much more of a dialogue than it is yes. someone being like a Gordon Ramsay and yelling at someone and telling them they're fucking it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have to, I have to say this cuz this is my father is a chef and has worked in kitchens for like his whole life and he has mm-hmm. said I love Gordon Ramsay, I'm not going to lie, but he has said that if anybody ran their kitchen the way Gordon Ramsay does, they would quit. They would never work for someone yeah. like that. And whether or not that's true, I just, I think that's interesting to, <laughs> to think about. But you're right. That, but even so, even though Gordon Ramsay is a very extreme example, you know, and he could be hamming it up to the cameras, which he probably is. Of course. Yeah. Um, but even like when you, like even watching like Top Chef and like watching chefs like in challenges, you know, in, with, many of them are executive chefs who run a kitchen. And it's a very it's very different it's not a dialogue it's very much like this is what's happening this is what you're doing you know mm-hmm. and yeah and you're right and he has a very different approach very very collaborative approach which is nice yeah the man makes good cookbooks too we have his <laughs> Jer- jerusalem cookbook which i highly recommend <laughs> nice <laughs> all right well do we have any final thoughts let him eat cake no but i'm <laughs> but all right Let's move on to our next film, Antonio Campos's The Devil All the Time. Or as they say in the movie, The Devil All the Time. So, because they're all Southern. 
My girl wants to devil all the time. The time devil, devil all, all the, time. the time. Devil all the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's what I kept thinking every time <laughs> yeah. I heard the title. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first thing I thought of when I was watching this movie is like, there are no Americans in this movie, in this movie that takes place in fucking West Virginia and, you know, Southeastern Ohio. This is weird. <laughs> Maybe uh, Haley Bennett. She might be the only one. Ka- Riley Keough is American. Oh, yeah. Too. Riley Keough, too. Yeah. about Sebastian Stan? Is he, what's is he American? Deal? I don't know. Um, but, you know, you've got uh, Jason Clark and Tom mm-hmm. Holland and Bill Skarsgård and Robert Pattinson, uh, Robert Pattinson, Mia Wasikowska. Yep. They're all uh, from the, you know, different parts of the crown. Well, except for Bill Skarsgård. That's a different crown. But um, <laughs> It's a different crown. <laughs> but um, this is one of those movies that I'm just going to. Uh, what? So how do you even explain this? It's about this uh, kid who has a turbulent life growing up and everybody he loves dies or abandons him or both. <laughs> yep. And in the end, he kills everybody who ever wronged him. <laughs> that's basically what it is. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's about as good We're as you're going to get. Yeah. Without that getting too much into the weeds of this movie, which you could very easily do. Oh my do, God, there's so many weeds. Wouldn't suggest it. There's so wouldn't many suggest weeds. it. <laughs> yeah, well, this is one of those movies where you've got like three or four rel- very distinct storylines that all come together kind of late, um, which is good. I mm-hmm. like that. And I like the fact that they're able to pull it off. The other thing that was kind of struck me about this was I didn't really find any interesting new ideas in this movie, but God damn it, if I wasn't still riveted, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, also, I was not riveted. <laughs> uh, I also thought that um, it was a slog through. Um, it was a slog up until Tom Holland showed up. Basically, yes. Uh, I feel like we watched an hour of backstory before we got to the hour of the real story. <laughs> yeah. Well, the hour and the hour and uh, let's see if it's an hour. The one thirty-eight minutes. Yeah, 78 minutes, you know, we this movie could have been an hour and 18 minutes, but instead it was two hours and 18 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that is interesting to me, though, I don't know if anybody picked up on this. All the women who die in this movie get shot or ha- in the neck. They all die via the neck. Mia Wozakowski gets stabbed in the neck. What's her name? Eliza, Eliza Scanlon hangs herself. And then Riley mm-hmm. Keough gets shot in the neck. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was like... Oh, yeah, Haley Bennett is the only one who doesn't. Yeah, she dies yeah. of cancer. Yes. So of the maybe neck. With throat cancer. <laughs> <laughs> cancer of the neck. Oh my god. <laughs> um, I say throat cancer and cancer of the neck. <laughs> yeah. So I was also, but there there was one thing that surprised me. It was when Jason Clark kills his first victim that we see on screen because. Mm-hmm. I just thought that there were going to be some weirdos who wanted to take pictures of a guy, you know, having sex with his wife and like, no, they wanted to kill him too. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's where we're going with this. Um, well, they alluded to that earlier. The narrator mm-hmm. says that they're serial right. murderers. Oh, does he say that at the top? I don't remember. Yeah, he does know? pretty yes, early does. on. Yeah. Like when he meet when Jason Clark meets um, Riley Keough, he says, yeah, he said that's when he says that. Oh, uh, okay. See, I, uh, it was the beginning of the movie where I was not paying nearly as much attention. Because <laughs> Tom Holland <laughs> right. wasn't there. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. also, just like the whole story, like the Bill Skarsgård character, he's not a bad guy, but he's also kind of a douche. I mean, you know, his kid gets beat up and he's like, I'll tell you how to fight, kid. But then they're praying to like, you know, mom have mom's cancer goes away and he slaps him in the back of the head mm-hmm. for not praying hard enough. It's like, right. all right. And, you know, they're I know praying things to yard are- Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> praying to yard Jesus and then crucifying the dog. Oh my fucking god! You know, yeah. Like, let's let's horrible. mention that right out the right off the bat. There's you know dog death slash dog crucifixion. How often can you say that in the movie? But content warning, please, for the love of God, if that bothers you, do not watch this movie. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize that that was happening until I was already well, into the movie. Then then also I forgot to com- mention the the opening crucifixion. <laughs> On the battlefield. Yep. Yes. <laughs> There's that one. This is a grim fucking movie. Let's just put that out yes. there. It's it's long. There's places where it's a slog. It's very grim subject matter. And I find it has this weird tone where it's being very serious, but I can't help but laugh at how hard it's trying to be serious. Yes, it definitely takes itself too seriously. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Because like when Eliza Scanlon accidentally hangs herself, well, she's going to hang herself. And then she's like, no, I don't have to hang myself. But then she accidentally hangs herself. And it's like, Mm -hmm. this isn't supposed to be funny. This is supposed to be tragic. But it's kind of funny for the wrong reasons. It's just like... Right. Also because you can see it coming a mile away. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. it's like... I'm just like, I got to watch this poor woman like go through all the, the machinations and then die anyway. I was just like, oh. yeah, this film is so disturbing and bleak and just, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, the narrator was good. It's the author. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. Is it? It's Ray uh, and Pollock. I think it's Ray Pollock or Ray and Pollock. Donald Ray Pollock. Donald Ray yeah. Pollock. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it also is. Known the, as budget yeah. Sam Elliott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I wish it was Sam Elliott. I was kind of but thinking yeah. budget Waylon Jennings, but oh, okay. But yeah, but when I heard the narration, I was like, this has got to be based on a book because like the the tempo and the pacing and just just everything about it. And yep, it is. Yeah, it's his book. But yeah, this, yeah. Whew. I mean, yeah. like, so here's my problem with the film. Um, besides the fact that a lot of it is, is, I, see, I don't feel like it's boring, but Slog is kind of not wrong um, like definitely the film gets way more interesting when tom holland and robert pattinson are on screen too yeah. um and the two of them together like the church scene is so good so that was good. a good scene that's i think that's a great scene riley keogh is amazing in this too i mean she's always great you know same with Haley bennett actually everybody that's the sad thing like everybody who's in this is a really fantastic actor but just yeah Great, great cast, but yeah, unfortunately, yeah, there's not a lot great for them cast to do in a way. I mean, there is action wise, but my big problem with the film, and this kind of ties into that, is that if you're going to have a really dark, bleak, you know, depressing, brutal, grim film, okay, all right, I'm on board. That's fine to a degree. That's fine, or maybe not even to a degree. It's just fine. But here's the thing: if you're going to explore the nature of evil. And you're going to look at different kinds of evil and machinations of evil and all that. You really have to explore and dig into those reasons. Like you have to have some nuance and some complexity and and really get in to character development. And I feel like even though we have such an incredibly long backstory before we really get to Arvin as, as a teenager, which is Tom Holland... I feel like it's just, it still somehow feels surface level to me. Like every, every character feels paper thin. They don't feel like, they feel like caricatures. They don't feel like fully fleshed out people. And that's a massive problem in a film like this. Yeah. I, I thought it was going to be, the moral of the story was going to be like people of faith die mm-hmm. horribly. But then a couple of people, <laughs> seriously, I thought this was like, ooh, this is an anti-religion story. But then Sebastian Stan who we have no idea what his really, I mean, yeah. Or Riley Keough. We don't know what their story is other than their brother and sister. And they're both fucking weird. <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing. Like, so she's a serial killer who doesn't really seem to enjoy it all that much. No, I don't think she <laughs> wants to be a serial killer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Jason yeah. Clark's He's character is just time. no fun. He's all business about the also, serial Also, I have to say if, if, <laughs> If a guy who looked like Jason Clark and not from the movie where he's the, the Australian climber, well, he is Australian, but where he plays the climber who, who dies on the side of the true story, dies on the side of Mount Everest. If he's, if he's looking like every other Jason Clark character, would you ever get in a car with him? I mean, really? That is one hard looking dude who looks like he's never shaved. His eyes are, he's always <laughs> squinting. He's way too friendly. What? Just. Stay away from this fucking guy. I'm not entirely sure what you mean, but okay. I'm saying like every movie I've seen Jason Clark in, he usually plays a bad guy. Not always, but usually. And it's just like, I, I don't want to be alone with a, in, a, in a car with a guy who looks like this because he's going to try to kill me, which Plenty he does. The apes. He wasn't bad. Like, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but you're right. He's a bad True. guy in like everything else. Yeah. Some of the killing was uh, there was there was good killing was in this movie. I mean, I didn't find well, any of the killing satisfying. I, I mean, sort of. Uh, I, I liked some of the same. Uh, there was some inventiveness in the killing. I think that the whole idea that Tom Holland basically got lucky with every person he killed was kind of fascinating. Um, you know, Jason Clark taking the bullets out of Riley Keough's gun and replacing them with blanks because he doesn't trust his own wife not to kill him. <laughs> 
So that's how she ends up dead. Robert Pattinson almost getting away because he throws that Bible at Tom <laughs> Holland and Tom Holland shoots him the first time almost by accident. I you know, he threw the Bible. <laughs> um, yeah. Sebastian Stan, who I don't even know what he was thinking. It's like, you've got a shotgun. He's got a nine millimeter. You're already ahead of the game on this really one. Are. And then you just fire into the side of the fucking tree that's fallen over. What the hell is the matter with he you? He's jumpy. You know? So, yeah, he was, that's true. He was jumpy. I just thought that it always kind of amazed, like movies where uh, people get lucky with the way they kill always kind of fascinate mm. me. <laughs> so I guess that's what I'm getting at. And also... I did not, the one thing I didn't see, I knew that Mia Wasikowska was going to die because they say at the beginning, it's like, that was the last time they'd see her daughter and they found her in a ditch seven years later. It's like, whoa, what the fuck? And then she's gone and she doesn't come back for like 45 minutes. And you're like, oh, now they're going to explain it. <laughs> but when her husband stabs her in the neck with that screwdriver, I, I knew he was going to kill. Yeah, I, I knew he was going to kill her. I didn't mm-hmm. know it was going to be that. I mean, good God, yeah, was that absolutely. horrific. And then this is what happens when you grow up with religion. He's like, I, I, he's screaming, I'm going to resurrect you. I mean, what? What? This is insane. And this is, that's, this is part of the reason I found this movie, I think, more interesting than you guys did. Because I was just like, these people are loons. <laughs> and, you know, I'm watching a bunch of Looney Tunes, you know, uh, basically kill the shit out of each or other. Or people unhinged so. as maybe we want to be a little more, <laughs> a little more sensitive. Yeah. People unhinged. <laughs> sure. I also did appreciate the fact that even though Sebastian Stan, who plays a sheriff who is under the thumb of this local gangster, and you get the impression that his, the gangster basically tells him, you got one more shot with me, uh, then I'm going to kill you because you're, you're fucking up my business. Um, I appreciate the way he very quietly and methodically goes and like kills the gangster and his henchmen and neither of them sees it coming because it's like, they're not afraid of this guy. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to fucking show you what I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, Right. Yeah, this movie is roof. Roof stoof. (laughs) What is Um, roof stoof? (laughs) Oh, rough. (laughs) Rough stuff. (laughs) Sorry, I'm like, I don't know what that means. Isn't that code? (laughs) So. (laughs) Woof, woof. Yeah. Roof, roof. And I also, I also didn't think it looked very good. Oh, okay. So it was like, it looked, it looked fine. It looked okay. But I think that a lot of the, uh. The, the like the mm-hmm. color palette was just like it was too uniform throughout, and uh, I just it really I don't know. You know how a lot of times the that like filmmakers use that use that sort of like um, yeah. orange mm-hmm. haze or yellow haze for a nostalgic sort of past. This is like the past is made of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything's just yeah. just gray, gray and brown and whatever. And the only time you ever see any color is right before Riley Keough and Jason Clark are about to kill someone. <laughs> so it's like, oh, good Lord. You know? Anyway, so that's how I've, I've talked too much. Please, can you guys Speaking go. Of, uh, Riley Keough and Jason Clark, I, the one, this is kind of disturbing, but the one thing I do like visually is when her brother is at their house and the they're negatives. looking at the negatives. And that was so stunning. Like, that was and and so super creepy, creepy, creepy yes. and visually stunning. Yeah, that was that was great. Yeah. I wish there were more mm-hmm. flourishes like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was my favorite moment in the movie. Mm-hmm. I remember yep. making a note about it too because I just thought that this yep. was such a standout scene. That was such a great effect. Super creepy. Super original. That's not something I see very often in a movie, and I really enjoyed it. And I was going to say, it's like, you already know that Sebastian Stan's a bad guy because he's killed those gangsters. But then this is when you realize he's evil. Because, <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm more interested in saving my career as sheriff of this town than, you know, letting all of these people who's who knows how many people his sister and Jason Clark killed. You know, you get the idea that it's a whole mm-hmm. lot. And, yep. uh, and then he's going to go kill the guy who is a witness to it, basically. But that feeds into, back to my point, where we don't, like, it just, it feels so one-dimensional. It doesn't really feel like he, he or many of the other characters are fleshed out, unfortunately, so. Yeah. 
it does feel like this mm-hmm. movie is more interested in the plot of tying yes. all the threads together than it is in fleshing right. out the characters. Exactly. Then that and that feels gimmicky. It feels very gimmicky. It's like, oh, how do we get here? How are we gonna shoehorn all these characters and timelines and events in so we get to this, you know, where we where everything comes to a head? And yeah, and that's I think that's that's a problem. And if if this is actually like if this is a very faithful adaptation, which it very well could be. This is the problem I have with film adaptations is that you don't always have to be so faithful. The whole point is this is a different art medium. You can take some risks. You can take some chances. You could do something a little different. So, yeah, I don't know. It just, yeah, it just felt gimmicky to me. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I, we've had this talk on the show many times about how I'm like source material doesn't mm-hmm. matter. <laughs> Agree. You know, so in many, many ways, they're very, so can, very rarely will I, would I disagree with you on that. <laughs> yeah. So, but I will say that the I, I think the acting is incredible, especially by Tom Holland, especially by Robert Pattinson. I think I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk for a moment about the accents in this film because there are some weird choices, especially Robert Pattinson's, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. apparently. Uh, Antonio Campos did not know what his voice was going to sound like until day one of filming. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which is bizarre <laughs> in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, some of the accents were, I mean, they were not uniform. No. I mean, now not everybody is from the sure. same place. So that's, you know, fine. I don't know. I, I, I wanted somebody to sound like uh, Heath Ledger from Brokeback Mountain, but nobody did, you know? So I was waiting for someone who just barely speaks above a whisper and also mumbles, but there was none of that. So that no, was a but what I will say is, even though I don't think it's accurate in any way, shape, or form, Robert Pattinson's accent w- and performance are riveting. Speaking of riveting, they yeah. are very yeah. uh, captivating. And also the fact that his character's name is Preston Teagarden. Well, there's that. I'm just like, if you were ever, if there was ever a character who was written to be a bad guy. It's the guy named Preston Teagard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah, definitely because he's oh, yeah. also, you know, a creepy misogynist rapist too. Yeah. Yeah. Just the moment he shows up on screen is just like, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, all right. Do we have any final, final thoughts, feelings about <laughs> the film? Nah. All right. Not me. Let's move on to our Mm-mm. final film of the evening then. The evening. <laughs> You may be listening to this in the morning. Miranda July's Kajillionaire. That stars Evan. Oh, okay. <laughs> that stars Evan Rachel Wood, um, Richard Jenkins, Deborah Winger, and um, oh my God. Gina Rodriguez. Thank you. I, all I could think of was Jane from Jane the Virgin. <laughs> right. <laughs> Gina mm-hmm. Rodriguez. Yes. And it's basically a con film where Evan Rachel Wood's parents, they're con artists, and that is what the film is about. Yeah, they've raised her to engage in the cons. With Only her short cons. They say that they always, yeah, but they say that they always split things three ways. But at a certain, at a certain point, it's clear mm-hmm. that she keeps getting the short end of the stick with regard to pretty exactly. much everything in life, and she's just a really beaten down character. So, yeah. what did we think of this? What did you guys think of it? I thought it got better as it went along. Okay. <laughs> Well, because because it's cute and I don't like movies that are cute, but as it goes along, it becomes less cute and more serious. And that I liked, Um, like the bubbles coming through the side of the wall where they live. That's cute. You know, it's not, it doesn't serve a purpose. It's just Mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the comedy of that and the comedy with that landlord is just kind of like, uh, really forced I thought but I also thought I I really did like the relationship between the characters and I always like Richard Jenkins you guys know that Um, I usually really dislike Deborah Winger but let's give Deborah Winger credit for me not even realizing it was Deborah Winger until about halfway through I'm like wait a minute that's Deborah Winger so that's good and I always (laughs) like Gina Rodriguez and I like Evan Rachel Wood so you know the performances I thought were uniformly uh, pretty stellar and I sort of just dug the way it, it wound, you know, rounded itself out. But I did, uh, I saw the, like when they were returning all the gifts, I was like, this is going to add up to 525 or whatever the number was. And then it did. And uh, it's like, all right, well, okay, we've reached that place. 
Um, it took a long time to get there. We could have done this shorter. So that's how I felt. I still liked it, though. I did. I know it kind of sounds like I didn't, but I did. Evan, what did you think? It's been a while since I've seen a Miranda July movie. I remember The Future, which was a very long time ago. And so I guess I wasn't quite sure what I was in for. And then I started watching the movie and thought, okay, this is weird. And maybe I wouldn't normally like this brand of weird, but I did like this brand of weird. <laughs> I really, I really responded to this movie, but I think what I responded to was the aspect of Evan Rachel Wood coming out and forming a relationship with Gina Rodriguez and their relationship for me is what fueled the film. I, I thought that the all the conning stuff and the Richard Jenkins, Deborah Winger characters, I feel like normally I would find them more entertaining, but for whatever reason in this movie, I didn't find their conning to be very fun or entertaining. <laughs> it just felt just really they were cute. It just felt really mean. It is and mean. like yeah. they're despicable. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. They're just shitty, awful parents who just use and abuse their daughter. So I think I don't know. I think that normally I would find that funnier because it would maybe be played for laughs, but it's not really played for laughs. So it's hard to watch those aspects of the movie. But what I really like is when Gina Rodriguez enters the picture and how she shapes this relationship and kind of helps pull Evan Rachel Wood out of her shell and away from her parents to become her own fully formed person. And I loved, loved that aspect of the movie. I did too. I yeah, oh, so, sorry, Megan. I you do agree. agree. Um, I loved this film. I love how weird it is. I actually don't find it cute. And I think that's so interesting, Dave, that you do, because I don't. I know what you mean by like with the bubbles and, you know, the way they walk funny. And so I totally know what you mean. Like there mm-hmm. are cute elements, but to me, tonally, that's not at all what this film is. And like it's it's very eccentric and, you know, and right. you know, for lack of a better word, quirky. But I feel like there's so much heart to this film. And I think it is such an incredible exploration of loneliness. And I mean, there are so many scenes where Evan Rachel Wood, we see her like when she's Mm -hmm. all alone sitting on a bus and it really highlights her isolation. And like when she goes to the parenting class um, because someone pays her to go, a pregnant woman pays her to go and she's like the thought of being touched, just she's repulsed by that. She, you know, she has such a, such a visceral reaction to being touched because she was never really held or never had any affection as a kid. And that shit stays with you. And just those kinds of scenes. And like, there's this heartbreaking Mm -hmm. scene where they have money and she talks about, they're talking about the con Evan Rachel Wood and her mother, Deborah Winger. And she says, well, we could go just the two of us and we could have a mother-daughter getaway. And she's dead serious. And Deborah Winger like dismisses her, rebuffs her, and is just so cruel to her. And it's just, it's gutting to watch. And so I completely agree with you, Evan, that the film, I mean, I I found the film really, Mm -hmm. really fascinating right from the start. But when Gina Rodriguez enters the picture, it's, it, it's a completely different tone and it's, she's so magnetic and just bubbly and, you know, effervescent on screen. And Mm -hmm. she's so good in this role and she's so good here. And I just, I love, I also love their interactions and their relationship. And like right from the start, like when Gina Rodriguez starts playing the piano and Evan Rachel Wood is just watching her, just like her eyes are glued to her. And then like when their hands touch in the diner and and Evan Rachel Wood is taking off her fingernails because she accidentally Mm -hmm. broke one of hers. There's just such a tender sensuality to it. And it's just, it's really great to see them connect on, you know, multiple levels. And I just, and the ending is so queer and I love it. It's wonderful. Yeah, ends and with the a ending, makeout sesh. Yes, but it's also <laughs> such, it's like such a rom-com <laughs> ending. <laughs> it's like so oh, yeah. perfect yeah, it is. for this film. <laughs> I also, I dug how Gina Rodriguez saw yes. through them, saw through the parents yes. immediately. She's like, oh, you guys are like full mm-hmm. of shit, you know, just... Like even on the plane, I also liked uh, how their relationship, their relationship, meaning hers, uh, Gina Rodriguez and Evan Rachel Wood. I like how that played out too. Um, I kind of left that out when I was criticizing <laughs> the movie earlier. When I was calling it a piece of shit, um, I did uh, like the way that their relationship played out, and I like that Gina Rodriguez was her character was not 
Like she saw through them. She knew they were con artists and she just stuck with it. She stuck with uh, old mm-hmm. Dolio as Evan Rachel Woods. David. I love that was one of the things that actually that would normally be what I would consider Megan ah. a cute touch. But I loved that explanation and the way Evan Rachel Wood played that scene when she explained mm-hmm. that her name was old Dolio. <laughs> Um, normally that's the kind of thing like weird names in movies. I'm just like, that's lazy, but this has a whole story and a whole reason. And it makes perfect sense with everything. So I dug that. Um, and yeah, I liked their uh, little makeout sesh at the end too. Not because it was a queer makeout sesh, but because it's just like, Oh, that's sweet. They like, they're finally, you know, old Dolio is finally going to experience happiness. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I I felt a lot of warm and fuzzies when they were on screen together and, yeah, when they're they're touching hands in the um, the diner, one of the scenes that really moved me was when they go to that guy's house to rip him off, and he's laying in bed dying, and he just oh god, he just wants people to be there and to have noise and to feel like he has company, even though they're in the other room. Mm-hmm. And I just found that to be a very compelling scene, and I loved how the characters threw themselves into their roles. Like they're talking about, oh, what are you having for dinner? How is your day? They're having these conversations. The Gina Rodriguez is playing the piano. Richard Jenkins is watching golf on TV. And I love that they kind of abandon. They're still there for the con. They're still there to rip the guy off at the end. But I f- love that they really throw themselves into their roles <laughs> and become immersed in these characters in this few minutes where they're all in this house pretending to be a family and acting normally so this guy can have some moments of peace and calm and company so he can die. I, I agree with you. That scene is so so sad um, and great too. But what I also love is, and of course, because I'm going to focus on the queerness here, I also love that there's another queer moment where, you know, Gina Rodriguez says that Evan Rachel Wood is like the refrigerator repair person. And she's like, ooh, lonely housewives must be throwing themselves at you. And she's like, yeah. I'm just here to do a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She clearly is missing the sarcasm in so many mm-hmm. moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally missing the flirtation and the sarcasm. Yeah, it's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah, but there, yeah, it's, I think this is really also an interesting film on parenting and really abhorrent parenting and what you do with that, like how you handle that kind of, that kind of trauma of not, of being neglected and not having, you know, not being taught any boundaries, not being taught, you know, how to self-soothe, all these kinds of things that, you know, have good, healthy parent-child relationships instill. And, you know, seeing Gina Rodriguez, you know, treat Evan Rachel Wood like a person and treat her tenderly. And, you know, she compares her parents, she compares her relationship to her parents like a drug addict. And it's really, that's a really rough comparison, but not wrong. And, you know, there's a lot of codependency there. And so seeing Evan Rachel Wood pull herself away, extricate herself from her parents is, is such an, such a rewarding and uplifting thing to see mm-hmm. by the end, to see her, the trajectory of her character and of their relationship. And yeah, just to see her become her own person and have a relationship of her own is, it's just so beautiful. I love it. I'm going to break in and say, cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I dig that. And I think for me, that's what makes this movie is their relationship and it, how it blossoms and how old Dolio <laughs> comes Got out of her name. shell. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I will say there's, I also really appreciated that there is commentary on um, racism too, because when they're talking, when all four of them are talking about, you know, doing a con and Gina Rodriguez gets really nervous about being caught. And she's like, well, it'll be different for me because I'm Puerto Rican. And, you know, it's it's one line. It's it's a brief moment. But I love that that's there because that's so true, you know, because they're white and totally. she's not. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we're all in. You guys loved, I loved it. it. And I thought it was, you know, thought it was, uh, it was you know, it was good. Yeah. It's it. not. I can't say it's normally the kind of movie I would enjoy, but I really got into it. I, it 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 was a brand of weird that w- it was putting it down and I was picking it up. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. 
Yeah. It's a good way to put it. I completely it. agree. I, I definitely love it. And, you know, it's it's interesting, Dave, you were talking about how you saw the, the ending coming a mile away and you saw the, like, the gifts because her parents, you know, buy her gifts one for each year because they never bought her uh, birthday presents before. And when she returns them, yeah, it all adds up to the money that, that they would split three ways. I, I uh, also thought it was a nice touch that it was the necklace that finally got everything to add up to 525. Mm. <laughs> but, <laughs> Agreed. I thought that was really funny. Yeah. And that Gina Rodriguez had to unclasp it from Evan Rachel Wood's mm-hmm. neck, thereby initiating ooh, close contact. Mm-hmm. What did you guys think of her, uh, her voice, her vocal affectation? I kind of thought it made sense, actually. At, at first, I was like, huh, that's an interesting choice. Then I was like, well, you know, if you've got no frame of reference for what it's like to, you know, be a person who lives what her parents would consider, you know, a normal life where you strive to be a cajillionaire, which is where the title of the movie comes from. And you're just kind of unsure of yourself and, you know, mm-hmm. desperate for love and sort of hunched over. It makes perfect sense to me that she would sound like that. I don't know. I thought that that was a, a that choice made a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I thought it made sense. It didn't feel out of place to me. What about you, Megan? No, I agree, Dave. I think that was an excellent way to describe it. And I, I definitely agree. And yeah, I mean, huh. I love Evan Rachel Wood as an actor anyway, but especially the way she embodies this character and all her her mannerisms and her voice, like everything just screams, I'm lonely and I want to be loved and I'm so not loved. And it's just, it's so sad and so tragic, but then it has such a great ending. So no longer tragic. Well, then let's do a recap. So residue, I think we would say, see it. Yes, I would say see it. I would as well. Otolenghi and the Cakes of Versailles. Oof. I'm on the fence about this one. I'm, I'm going to say pass. Okay. I'm going to say see it. Um, if you are really into food, like if you are really into, you know, food documentaries, food history, that sort of thing, I would say see it. All right. What about the devil all the time? If you skip the first hour, I think that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. See it. Hard Whatever. pass. And I'm going to say skip it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Okay. All right. And Kajillionaire. See it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so lukewarm. I'm going to say a very enthusiastic see it. This is, I think, a must see. It's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're entitled to your opinion. Jeez. My opinion is right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Spoiler Peace Theater. We want to give a huge, 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 huge thank you to our amazing editor, Otto Clammer. Otto, thank you for everything you do. You always make us sound great. Thank you so much. Thanks. You can find us anywhere you get podcasts. Um, you can also find us at our website, spoilerpiece.com. You can find us on social media. We are Spoiler Peace Theater on Facebook, and we're at Spoiler Peace on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. So come follow us, talk to us. We want to hear from you. And speaking of that, you can also reach out to us by email. You can email us at spoilerpiece at gmail.com. You can even give us a call at 86221peace. Leave us a message. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you think of these films. Let us know what you think of other films that we've covered. Just talk to us. Yeah. (laughs) And if you like the show, please rate and review us. That really helps us out. You can rate us at Apple Podcasts. You can also rate us at ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece. Mm-hmm. And if you really, really like the show, you can join our Patreon. This week's Patreon, we talked about the film John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness. It was selected for us by one of our $10 patrons. And if you give $10 a month, That's what you get to do. You get to pick a film for us to watch and we talk about it. And if you give $5 a month, you get access to monthly polls and to weekly bonus episodes. So you don't want to miss that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And we also want to take this moment to thank our amazing patrons. Yeah, we want to say thank you to Bill Scahan or Ski Scahan. Thank you to Sean Pensionar, Christopher Jensen, Bob Chipman, Davida Margolin. Zach Pigeon, Chris Wilkinson, Elisa, Max Coville, Shona Glasgow, Rory Glenn, Shelley M. McCaskill, Mike, Lord of the Sith, Deirdre Crimmins, <laughs> and of course, Shauna Harris. Thanks, patrons. Thank you guys you. rock. <laughs> really do. We have the best patrons. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, my name is Megan Kearns. I am a contributor to Edge Media Network, 
and a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. You can follow me on Twitter at Opinion S World and on Instagram and Letterboxd at The Opinion S. My name is Dave Riedel. I write for Salt Lake City Weekly. You can find me in all the usual places on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd, Dave Sees Movies. And I forgot to mention, I'm also a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And my name is Evan Korean. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. You can follow me on Twitter and on Letterboxd as Real Recon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.